when considering uh, what introduction would go well this Memorial Day weekend for our text out of 1 Corinthians, uh, I thought of uh, a book that I enjoyed and a movie that I appreciate, uh, both called The Bridge Too Far. A Bridge Too Far was written by Cornelius Ryan. It was a film that was made in 1977. An excellent film co follows the book closely. They're both about Operation Market Garden. If you remember your World War II history, Operation Market Garden, that's from September uh, 17th to 25th, 1944. So D-Day is June 6th, 1944. This is three months uh, in change later. The Allied armies are approaching the Rhine, uh, the last frontier of Germany. Uh, this is before, of course, uh, the Battle of the Bulge, which will come in December. Uh, and so the Allied armies are trying to decide, how can we end this war in 1944? How can we get across the Rhine and not have to wait out the winter and then come at this again in the spring? Let's finish this. Uh, and General Montgomery uh, had a plan to send paratroops forward and seize the bridges over the Rhine and other bridges as well, and then have an armored thrust go up and consolidate that, and then they would invade the Ruhr, the industrial heartland of Germany uh, in the northern plains there, and end the war. And so they allocated the troops for it, they coordinated the plan, and had a massive aerial drop of airborne troops, British and American, behind enemy lines, trying to seize the bridges. However, from its outset, things didn't go quite to plan. It was an intricate plan. It depended upon a timetable being kept, and unfortunately, setbacks and slowdowns and obstacles uh, were always in the way of the armored troops find, uh, pushing their way forward uh, to reach the paratroops. In the end, the 1st British Airborne Division was encircled at Arnhem for days and suffered massive casualties from the German counterattack because they could not be relieved. And eventually they had to uh, escape and find their way back to Allied lines. The bridge over the Rhine was never taken, as the name of the book and movie implies. It was a little bit too audacious. It was a bridge too far, too much to try. So why are we talking about this this morning? Not uh, for any particular uh, reason about the strategy, but it's an interesting example in military history of the need to learn from history. Future strateg strategists, future planners have looked at Operation Market Garden and tried to figure out where did it go wrong? What could they have done differently? How could they have made it a success? Or was it doomed from its beginning? Studying history, and military history in particular, is what a smart, would-be military leader does in every nation. In our text this morning, the Apostle Paul is going to tell us we need to learn from history. We need to pay attention in history. Out of curiosity, anyone in the room who, for whom social studies and history was your favorite class? One. Two, three, four, hey, five, a few. Hey, that's better than usual. Uh, it was one of the subjects that I was licensed to teach. Uh, not too many people like history. Bunch of dead people, names, places, blah, blah, blah. Who are they? Don't care. Well, we care about history. It's important, and especially this history here. So let's look at the beginning of the text. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 1, it says this, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud, and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank, drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ." I emphasize the word all purposefully there because it's repeated four times by Paul in this 
And that's for a fact. He wants us to remember that all of their ancestors, now these are spiritual ancestors because the people at the church of Corinth are not primarily Jewish. They are primarily Gentiles. So these are spiritual ancestors in the faith as the book of Hebrews in chapter 11 makes, us, makes it clear to us that Abraham and Moses and David, they are our ancestors in the faith even if we are not descended from them. He says they all were under the cloud. That would be the cloud that led the people during, uh, during the day. There was a pillar of fire at night and a cloud during the day to lead the people from Egypt to the promised land. That was the visible presence of God. So they all saw the visible manifestation of the presence of God. That's an amazing thing. They all passed through the sea. They all stood there on one side of the Red Sea and watched the water part and walked through on dry land and when they got across Pharaoh's army was destroyed they all saw that they all saw the power of God with their own eyes then he says they were all baptized into Moses that's not a literal baptism this is a initiation this is a symbolic of the fact that they were all part of the covenant they were all on uh, uh, part of the program they were all involved. He says they all ate the same spiritual food and drink. Remember that when they were in the desert, God sent them manna. And then when they needed water, God had Moses uh, bring forth water from the rock. And so they all had food and drink from the hand of God. That spiritual blessing, Paul says, was the same as Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is God and remember that Jesus himself said, I am the bread of life and I am the living water. And so they all had that same spiritual blessing. This is an elaborate way for Paul to say that the whole nation of Israel were part of God's plan. He brought them all up out of Egypt with the intention of bringing them all into the promised land. Every one of them was given God's guidance, God's support, God's blessings. Maybe they didn't know Yahweh before they left Egypt. Maybe they didn't know anything about the God of their forefathers before they left Egypt. But by the time they crossed the Red Sea and had gone to Sinai and were given the law by Moses, they had certainly witnessed the power and provision and love of God. So what would your expectation be? As part of a people who had seen God and had witnessed his power, would we not expect that based upon that, the cloud, the Red Sea, the manna, the water from the rock, all of that and more, that based upon that, we would have high expectations, would we not? high expectations that the people would be both faithful and obedient to God. But this is a reminder for us that faith is not mathematics. There is not a faith formula. A plus B does not always equal C. That's some of that math with letters, right? Some of you hate the math with letters. But that's not the way it works with faith. You can't say if we give people this plus this, they will have faith. If we teach them this and that, they will obey it. Always. It's not like math because people are not machines. You cannot be programmed like a computer to always do what you are told. Not that your computer always does what it's told, but in theory it will. So in the church age... We are not Israel, we are not in the desert. What's the equivalent of this? Consider a, a person raised in the church, in church most Sundays, gone to Sunday school, sent to VBS, maybe church camp, baptized in the church, participating in communion. That's the kind of person he's talking about. Someone with all of those blessings and all of those promising marks in their life. But the next verse is this. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. That's a tough turn. All, all, all had those blessings. 
Nevertheless, in spite of, unexpectedly, God was not pleased with most of them. In a moment, we're going to see some examples of the things which the people were doing which displeased God, and we'll look at those. It was large-scale rebellion and disobedience. And so in the end, only Joshua and Caleb were were allowed to enter into the promised land. The shockingly widespread and repeated acts of unbelief, immorality, rebellion, led to this brutal outcome. This is not the way it was supposed to be when the people walked across the Red Sea. This was not the way it was supposed to end when they sat at the foot of Mount Sinai as Moses went up to take the law. This was a journey begun with promise that ended in judgment, not blessing. When Montgomery laid his plans, he said, we will end this war in 1944. All we need to do is seize these bridges. It will be the end. But it didn't work out. And so the war slogged on into 1945 with plenty of other difficulties ahead. The people were supposed to just march from Egypt to Canaan to the Promised Land, but it didn't work out that way. You see, God is quite clear here. He was not messing around with them. He was not amused when they disrespected him. After bringing them up out of Egypt with power, after sharing his truth with them when he gave them the law, the people responded multiple times, not just once. Ten times are mentioned in the text. Ten times with immorality and rebellion. Do you expect God to ignore that? Do you expect God to say, oh, oh well, close enough? Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. That's some stark imagery there. Now listen to this. This is why Paul is writing this. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. The answer to the question, why is Paul telling these Gentile Christians about the history of Israel and their failure in the desert? It's the same reason that we study history, church history in particular, why we try to learn from our ancestors in the faith. Because when they have victories, there are lessons to teach us. When they have failures, there are lessons for us to learn there as well. Each of those confirm for us that the promises that God has made end up being fulfilled. They confirm to us that his blessings will come and his curses. So that we too, having learned from our ancestors in the faith, both ancient and modern, those who have gone before us, when we learn from their example and how they did things, both good and bad, then we take the word of God seriously when he says, do this or don't do that. We truly believe that he means it. And it also helps short-circuit that delusion that comes upon every generation. Many individuals in every generation are deluded into thinking, and this is not my generation or the next or the last. We all do this at some point. We delude ourselves into thinking that we are unique, that we are somehow a special generation or special individuals to whom the normal rules of life do not apply. We are somehow immune to lessons from the past. Won't happen to us. I can't tell you how many times as I was teaching alternative ed for 10 years, I heard a variation of that. This friend of mine OD'd. This other person got this problem. This other person, because of the drugs they were doing or the binge drinking, but I got it under control. Won't happen to me. You think they wanted to listen to an old man in his late 20s tell them that that was not the way of things? That's how they thought. They thought once you hit 25, it was all downhill. So we convince ourselves 
yeah, God was upset with Israel, and yeah, he punished them, but it's not going to happen to us. Paul says, don't delude yourself. Do not set your heart on evil. And here are the examples. These are some of the things that they did. He says, do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. Notice the repetition there. Some of them, some of them, some of them. It wasn't the whole nation, but it was a good number of them, time and time and time again. And eventually God said, we're, okay, we're done. I've had enough of all of you. Let's back it up and look at those. The idolatry refers to probably, he doesn't list exactly what he's talking about here, but we can look at the text and guess. Exodus 32 Moses is up on the mountain and the people are down there and they tell Aaron, build us a golden calf. We need something to worship. Of course, Moses smashing the Ten Commandments when he comes down, seeing that idolatry. The sexual immorality is from Numbers chapter 25. Uh, it's, uh, in that episode, Israelite men went off and had sexual relations with Moabite women that also involved bowing before their pagan idols. It was part of their pagan worship, this sexual behavior. And 23,000 of them died. It wasn't just a couple of them. <laughs> there were quite a few men involved in that. We should not test Christ. I think there he's talking about Numbers 21. When the people were impatient, it's taking too long to get to the promised land, they said, and they started complaining against Moses and against God. Moses, why did you lead us here? What was God thinking? Saying those kind of things. That's the episode where snakes came. And then the last one, do not grumble. That's the, wall, the straw that broke the camel's back, so to speak. Numbers 14, there at Kadesh Barnea is where you have the 12 spies that went into Canaan to look at the land. Joshua and Caleb said, we can conquer this land because God will fight for us. And the other 10 said, you're out of your mind. They're fortified cities. They've got huge men with brilliant uh, equipment as, for their army. We could never win. The people believed them. The people said, well, we can't do it. We need to go somewhere else. This is not going to work. In that moment, it's a fascinating text. Moses had to talk God out of destroying the whole nation. God said, Moses, <laughs> I've had it. I'm going to wipe them all out. We will start over with just you because I can't take these people anymore. And Moses said to God, God, you can't. What will they say back in Egypt? if you destroy the whole nation? What will they say about you as God? But God said there, not one of them will ever see the land I promised to their ancestors. No one who has treated me with contempt will ever see it. Just after that, the 10 who had said we can't do it died of a plague. Joshua and Caleb lived long enough to see their entire generation die as they wandered in the desert, primarily from just old age and natural causes, but none of them got into the promised land because they pushed and they pushed and they pushed against God. You see, they all received those blessings to begin with, but on 10 different occasions, they defied God through idolatry and sexual immorality, through grumbling, through testing God. And the end result was the same for each one of them. Physical death, if not spiritual death. Eventually, God's patience and his mercy was at an end. The entire generation suffered the loss 
of the promised land, and they did not live to see it. Their children did, but they did not. So how do we put this in the church age? How do we take this lesson that Paul says, pay attention to this, because this will happen to you if you do not listen? So let us suppose a local church or an entire denomination which is repeatedly indulging in immoral behavior. It doesn't really matter what it is. The people of that church, a goodly number of them, are repeatedly doing things against the law of God and the Word of God, and they are doing so again and again. Not only will those directly involved suffer the justice that they earn, not only will they one day stand before God and be accounted for, they might suffer spiritually and physically in this life as well. Not only that, but heed this, the whole community will be in danger of being rejected by God as a vessel not worthy of being the bride of Christ. This is a deep and serious truth that we need to understand. Churches can die. Now we know that because we've seen churches close, but that's not what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about a church where people just don't live there anymore and the congregation got old and they died. They closed the doors. That's what we would call natural causes when, 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 when it just didn't go from one generation to the next. I'm not talking about that. Because that's part of the natural order of things. Churches are planted, churches mature, and then sometimes they die. Sometimes they get a chance to renew and have a new lease on life. But if you remember, all of those seven churches that John wrote to in Revelation, none of them are still there, right? They're not there anymore. History happened, things happened, and now they are not there. Churches can come to an end by the hand of God. And God can simply say, you guys are done. You are no longer a church. The sign might not have changed out front, and they might still be holding some sort of services inside. But if the Spirit is not there, then they are not there. Yet we know at the same time that the universal church, the bride of Christ, the will of God will not be and cannot be thwarted, that God's kingdom will increase, that the number of people saved by the blood of the Lamb will only increase until it is a throng beyond counting that will one day bow the knee to Christ. So we know that the will of God cannot be thwarted, but the warning for us today for our denomination, for any denomination, for every church, not only in America, but around the world that exists to this day, is churches can die. If we defy God, if we spit in his eye, if we thumb our nose at God, the blessing will be withdrawn and it will be the end. Paul ends by saying, these things happen to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. Why are we given warnings? Why do you warn your children? Why do I like the song, The Coward of the County, so much? Promise me, son, not to do the things I've done, right? Great song by Kenny Rogers. Don't repeat the same mistakes. Don't do the things that others have done that ended in disaster. It's not that hard. Being connected to a church is not enough. That does not negate our immoral behavior. If we are part of a church, even a intimate part of a church, but we are living in immorality, it will not save us. Calling yourself a Christian does not mean you are one. As Jesus said, who are the children of God? Who are his brothers and sisters? Those who do the will of the Father. Those who follow the word of God. 
Three lessons for us to take from this as we walk away from this text. Number one, we need to learn from history. Our history, our church's history, our denomination's history, the church's history. There is so much for us to learn, good and bad. We need to learn it. Secondly, our immoral behavior has always mattered to God. If his church is living in in morality, it matters to God. It mattered to God when it was Israel. It matters to God now. And then lastly, how then do we protect our church here? How then do we protect the American Baptist churches, our piece of that puzzle? How do we protect our church? It's very simple. We live righteously. We reject evil. We spurn in morality. We follow the word of God. It's all we need to do. It's very simple. These were written that we would learn from their mistakes.